go. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, this is the second lecture since we've come back from quarantine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this Architalks here at Articulture is the second round of doing this. We did, uh, I did a, a lecture series at, called um, uh, Architecture of the Umlauf, which ran from 2007 to 2011. And then I picked it up again here in 2017. So we're on almost our fifth year with a little bit of a hiatus in between. And I think this is the first time for Scott to be speaking. So thank you again for coming out. And we're going to hear from AFA now. Hi, I'm Courtney with AIA Austin and the Austin Foundation for Architecture. I am standing in for Ingrid Spencer, who is our executive director. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, on behalf of the foundation, I must say that we are thrilled to be able to take Architox at Articulture under our wing. Um, it's an amazing program. It highlights the great the work of great architects in Austin, and we are so happy to help you um, continue this work. Um, just a little bit about the Austin Foundation for Architecture. We were established in 2007 as an offshoot of AI Austin to support young architects as leaders and promote design excellence to the public. So sort of have a more public facing um, side to AI Austin. Um, in 2017, we became a 501c3 and we've grown our public programs to include such things as exhibits, uh, partnerships with the park, parks department. You're probably familiar with uh, the park space, social distancing uh, squares around town. Um, and other public facing events like this one. Our goal is to be an interdisciplinary design convener to foster new ways of thinking and working and improve the livability of the built environment for all Austinites um, and to help all of Austin discover what design needs to them. Um, so this program fits right in. And thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Scott. And a huge thanks to our wonderful host, Art of Culture, and our wonderful sponsor of the program, uh, Builders First Source. And now I will turn the mic over to Articulture's Dante Dominic. Thank you so much, Courtney. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I really appreciate you all coming. Uh, and um, while you're here, wanted to take care of a uh, maybe. Maybe. Well, we're going to have to get this kink figure, uh, figured out before the thing starts here. <laughs> uh, I got it. Let me see. There we go. Um, I just wanted to say a, a, a couple things to take care of real quick. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for uh, um, honoring the COVID-19 policy. Um, Articulture here, we have our own COVID protocols and then Austin Foundation for Artic uh, Architecture has some great COVID protocols. We uh, appreciate you respecting everybody and uh, safely, safely socially distancing and having a good time. Um, we are a zero waste facility. I just wanted to mention that. Um, the plastic, they're not plastic cups, but what look like plastic cups, those are compostable. All the stuff that's coming with the food is compostable, so please go ahead and compost that. Um, of course, cans, and if you brought your own plastic cups, that goes in recycling. Uh, so thank you very much. Restrooms, if you haven't figured it out, we do have restrooms. They're in the building, and if you go in from the back, they're on the left behind the moss wall under the birch wall. That's the best way I can describe it. Um, Snacks, drinks, and everything. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Builders First Source. Thank you to AFA. Thank you for everybody who helps us make this uh, a wonderful event. Um, so, because uh, it's always more fun when there's drinks and snacks. Um, uh, and I, are there any first timers here at Articulture? Hey, all right. Thank you. So if you're wondering kind of what we do, this is where I get the, you know, the one minute to say who we are at Articulture. Obviously, we have a boutique and a plant nursery, but we do a lot more. We work with a ton of architects, a ton of uh, builders uh, and doing a lot of custom projects. Usually I show uh, like a, a living wall because we're kind of known for living walls and stuff like that. But I thought I'd do something a little different. We had a year and a half hiatus, so they had so many projects to choose from. But I thought I'd kind of show one that's a little different and shows our kind of breadth, like the sort of like interior plantscape thing. We usually do, like I said, there's a lot of living walls that we're known for, but this is a little bit different. This is actually at the Amazon building in Domain 10. Um, and this is on what floor? What floor? I don't know. But anyway, that's 7,000 pounds of uh, sand and gravel that the team brought up there and did this whole like desert scape. The client wanted a Marfa desert scape uh, thing. So that's what we did there. Uh, that kind of like the little Donald Judd inspired concrete blocks there um, uh, that, that kind of came together. That tumbleweed, that giant tumbleweed is one from Monique and I collected actually in Marfa uh, or just outside Marfa. There's sort of an aerial view of it. Um, 
it's I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, that's seven thousand pounds. How much? How much do you think the concrete blocks weighed? Very light. Uh, that's actually uh, we, uh, there was talk about doing concrete blocks, but uh, Monique at the last minute decided to do sculpted foam instead. That was then kind of treated that look as if it was weathered and whatnot, so made it a lot easier <laughs> to carry anyway. In the same project, some blackened steel that we do with like laser jet cutouts that then became kind of planted walls um, uh, that mirrored sort of like plants that were throughout the thing. I just you know like, uh, just a little different instead of showing the like the plant walls that we normally do. Thought I'd show that. Uh, but yeah, obviously if anyone, we have a boutique, we do a lot of custom work for residents, for uh, commercial projects, for a little bit of everything from a wide range. But next I'm gonna tell Wells. Wells is gonna tell you about Builders First Source. Thank you, Dante. And uh, thank you, Monique, for having us here tonight. Um, so. My name is Wells Mason, and I'm in a business development role for BMC, uh, which is also uh, Builders First Source. We merged, the two companies merged January 1st of this year. And so in my role, I work a lot with interior designers and developers and architects, uh, general contractors, and in some cases, homeowners to help them navigate the massive range of products and services uh, from BMC and BFS, uh, including windows and doors and trusses and engineered wood products and uh, decking and siding and you name it, just anything that it takes to build a house or do a uh, light commercial project or a multifamily project. And so uh, we've uh, sponsored this program for the last couple of years, and I'm really proud to sponsor it. It's one of my favorite things that I do in my role for BFS and BMC. And, uh, and I'm excited to hear about the project Scott's going to tell us about tonight. Uh, I've helped Forgecraft with some of their projects, and I've been to their office. They've got a great office on uh, it's South First Street. And uh, they're also very supportive of the arts community in Austin and uh, just a good, good group of folks. So I'm excited to hear this presentation tonight. Uh, thank you, Scott, and thank you, AFA, for helping us pull this off. All right. I'm just going to do a quick intro of our speaker, as I know you came here to hear him and not us. Um, Scott is one half of a partnership at Forgecraft Architecture. Rommel is the other one, and he was unable to be here tonight. Scott has graduated the University of Pittsburgh and has a Master's of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. He worked with student Rosenberg Architects in Philadelphia and then for 14 years here in Austin with Dick Clark Architects. <clears throat> In 2013, Scott and Rommel joined forces to forge Forgecraft, winning several awards along the way and having been featured on the AIA Homes Tour in 2014. And I'm going to plug our Homes Tour again this year. Um, it's a week from this weekend. It's the AIA 35th Anniversary Homes Tour. So if you haven't gotten your tickets, please do. <clears throat> and Sorry, Scott, I didn't mean to steal your introduction to promote the Homes Tour. Um, <clears throat> The name Forgecraft encompasses their design philosophy, harnessing the raw power needed to forge any building and honing the finer details then to craft excellence in human habitation. So I give you Scott Ender. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, also, thank you, Scott, for, for organizing um, this uh, event. Also, thank you to the Foundation for Architecture for all you do to promote us architects, and um, also uh, to Builders First Source for the sponsoring, and and uh, absolutely for um, Monique and Dante for uh, hosting this at Articulture, and um, I've known Monique and Dante for, for 20 years now, and um, it's so wonderful to see everything that they've uh, accomplished here, so um, that's awesome. This is a, a beautiful place, guys. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Can, all, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Uh, so I titled tonight's lecture, um, The Affordable, Hoping to Be Affordable and the Completely Unaffordable. Um, it's un somewhat tongue in cheek to say completely unaffordable. But the reason I've, I've titled it that is that um, we do a, a range of work with a concentration in affordable housing. Um, and we also include custom home designs in there as well. And so um, for us, when we're designing an affordable housing project or a custom home, it scratches the same design nerve. And, um, and the reason is that we always think that when we're designing affordable housing, while our materials might be 
less expensive to deal with than when we're dealing with a, a custom home, we still have to use those materials in a unique and um, intent, uh, with, with intent is, like, is what I like to say. Likewise, when we're designing a custom home, you can take a very nice expensive material and use it in a really boring sort of way. And, and so it, it and, and when you do that, you don't necessarily um, extract the value out of a really nice material. So even when you're designing with more expensive materials, you still have to use them in creative and expressive ways. So like I said, for us, it's, it's still um, about the design intent and how we as designers go through our daily lives and want to strive for excellence in all those project types. So I'll get started here. So the affordable. Um, so this is a, the first affordable uh, project that I designed. Um, and this was with Dick Clark Architecture. And this is for foundation communities. And foundation communities, if you don't know them, we're so fortunate to have them here in Austin. And designing the work with them is, is truly rewarding. And so foundation communities is a nonprofit. Uh, they design or they develop hou the housing using the affordable tax credit and if you don't know anything about the um, it's called the low income housing tax credit and this tax credit is a way that um, the uh, IRS actually helps fund affordable housing and so the tax credit is bought by a large corporation who has a big tax appetite and in return a developer builds housing and so this is a, a bipartisan uh, a, a program at the federal level that's has bipartisan support, and so it's a, um, a very successful program that was initiated under um, President Reagan. So in downtown Austin, uh, this was a site that was uh, just a block from the Capitol. This is 11th and Trinity, and this is uh, 135 units of housing for single adults. And it was the first affordable housing to be built in downtown in, in 45 years. So we can see that we're now starting to um, really invest in the community with affordable housing. We all understand now, I think in Austin, that affordable housing is for those who are, um, it's our friends, our relatives, um, family, neighbors, who at some point in their life need a place to live that is less than, say, the market rate project uh, that they might, might be next door. So when we design these projects, um, we're really looking at several things. We understand that people who live in affordable housing are gonna spend more time living in the housing than say a market rate project. And so we wanna make a place that attends to the social aspects of the people who live there, um, as well as design a beautiful project that sits in the middle of our community. So again, this is um, 135 units and there's um, two levels of parking below it. And so some of the things that we were trying to do here were um, really trying to, I'll back up here a second, but um, there's somewhat of an educational component for the affordable work that we do. Um, and also Foundation Communities has the same sort of um, understanding too that if we can make affordable housing look better than the market rate project next door, there's somewhat of a you know didactic component there to say, why not do more affordable housing? This is, this is really well-built housing. And so what we'd like to do is build in things of interest, um, make spaces like this um, in the middle of the project that have, um, attends to the social aspects of the folks who are gonna live here. And so this uh, courtyard with the hanging plants grew out of a um, kind of a seminar we did on, on biophilic design. And biophilic design meaning you know, bringing in uh, plants, bringing in those things of nature that we all know that improve our lives. And so these uh, planters, um, they were designed by uh, TBG Landscape Architects and they actually live and thrive and uh, flower at different times of year. And they make these uh, just a really nice backdrop for the center of the project. And so when we're designing on these urban sites like this, um, most times the only outside space that we can provide is in the structure of the building. Um, and so, uh, like I said, that project was uh, 
designed while I was at Dick Clark Architecture. Um, after I left um, Dick Clark Architecture, Foundation Communities came and asked um, uh, to do this next project, which is at Del Curto in South Lamar, uh, not too far from here. And so this was a, um, I think it was Kyle Chapman Motors when we got this site. Um, it's two thirds of an acre. And you can see right there is a project here, South Lamar. And this is uh, kind of at the bend in uh, South Lamar. Um, uh, Chipotle is um, right across the street. <laughs> to, here we go. Uh, so the project, again, is ar arranged around several different courtyards. So this is uh, what we call light well in this project. Um, and that light well goes from um, sky down to the first floor. So we tried to arrange the common spaces of the project around this light well to bring light into the center of the project. There is a, a small amount of parking for residents and staff. And, uh, and then there's a second light um, courtyard over here. And so what we're trying to do is a range all these uh, uh, unit, units around these uh, light wells. And so what that looks like from the outside is this. Um, the bottom is um, a very durable material like brick. The upper stories is a product called uh, Ethis, which is an insulated uh, stucco project product. And then to give the uh, exterior some uh, texture, we came up with these um, e uh, EFIS panels that kind of give it this quilted look. And then one of the things we always uh, struggle with with is affordable housing is that our window sizes are never that large. Um, yes, we want to bring light into the unit, but the cost of going to larger windows ends up being um, cost prohibitive sometimes. So what we did then was design these color panels beside the window to make it look uh, make the window look bigger. And so, yes, it's called Blue Bonnet Studios. And so, yes, these are the colors of Blue Bonnets. And then you say, well, why is there orange? And then that's the uh, Indian paintbrush that grows next to the Blue Bonnet. Um, and then, of course, the magenta are the little tops of the, uh, of the Blue Bonnets. Here's another view of the, the night, uh, the, the uh, evening sun raking across the, the quilting. The floor plans for these projects are very efficient. So this is, as you can see, 30 by 14 feet four. There is a kitchen. Uh, the bathrooms, we made every bathroom 100% uh, accessible. So every unit is um, accessible, at least in the bathroom design. And then um, the kitchens are either accessible or adaptable. And then, um, and then the units are um, you have a living space, a bed space, and a, a little island, right? And so um, these units are, uh, I think the, that equals 425 square feet, and um, everything is contained within that. Um, and we also like to point out that while the units are small, the social areas of the building are big, and so we always want to, like I said, want to attend to the social needs of the folks who are going to live here. This is the, the light well in the project, so the circulation is, is exterior. And we like to do exterior circulation in these projects um, as opposed to uh, kind of a long corridor. And we like to think that with these exterior circulation, it, it gives more opportunity for um, neighbors to meet each other. You can see this uh, stair that goes up through the light well. Uh, one of the tricks that we like to employ is called active design, where the the uh, stair is presented to you before the elevator is, so you're more inclined to take that stair first rather than go to the elevator. And so we, you know, we call that active design, it gives you a little bit more exercise within the building, but then it also gives you a little bit more opportunity to meet your neighbors as you're circulating through the building. And there's just another shot of the exterior. And uh, I love this shot with the guy riding his bike down the street. <laughs> And of course, the little blue bonnet detail inside the building. And this is the uh, Del Curto side. So one of the things that 
we realized, which I, I really should have uh, taken a photograph of, is this guy who has this unit right here at the end of the hallway grew uh, tons of plants over here. So if you drive by, the, the vines are streaming over the side. Um, it really gives a life to the, that side of the building. And so um, that became one of our uh, precedents for the design of the next project. And this is uh, Waterloo Terrace. And this is, again, Foundation Communities. Uh, Blue Bonnet Studios is also Foundation Communities. And so this is on North Lamar. This is um, uh, near the domain across the street from the, or across Mopac from the hospitals. So an area that really could use some affordable housing uh, for the folks who live or work at the domain, work at the hospitals. And you have to income qualify for these projects. And so they reserve units for the uh, folks making 30% of the uh, median family income, 50% and 60%. And so these are, um, you know, they use the, uh, the data charts to decide what those income levels are. But again, we're really trying to provide a place that someone who has, is not making a lot of money, maybe is on a, um, um, a disability, has a respectable place to live and, um, and can live with dignity. So the jumping off point for this project, as I said from the last project where the resident made a wonderful garden outside of his uh, door, was this courtyard. And again, this is a, it's on the side of a highway. Um, highway noise, not necessarily exterior space that you would comfortably enjoy. So we internalized the, all the exterior space to made this uh, wonderful courtyard. And then we also, the jumping off point from the last project is we made these um, areas of a, an extended sort of um, extension of the corridor or extension of the walkway. And this is meant to be in front of, or meant to be an extension where these two residents here can have a chair, can have plants, can sit, um, enjoy the courtyard, meet their neighbors. And this, um, this is a, a balcony that we called a, a fralcony, which is a, a front facing balcony which um, as we were designing this, I was watching Silicon Valley and Dinesh showed up with his new Tesla and said it's got a frunk, a front trunk. And so that was where the, the name for the Fralcony uh, came from. Um, and so we're, we really want to see these Fralconies uh, used uh, um, and made personal by the folks who live here. Um, like I said, there's not a lot of opportunity for uh, people to um, express themselves on like you might paint your house a different color um, so we're hoping that these can really be an expressive um, point or or not it just depends on your your personality so the courtyard has a, a number of different social spaces um, some you know small ones some big ones but we're really trying to attend to the social needs of um, many different types of uh, or a wide range of um, social experiences for the users So you can see there's a, a community garden in the works. Um, this is, this uh, area right here leads to uh, a small dog park. So residents are allowed to have dogs here. Um, and so the dog parks are, are very, very widely used. And then, um, you know, as far as the, the color concepts, you know, we're trying to express the structure. You know, here's the steel structure in yellow, and the, you know, the column and the beam structure. And then um, we have these downspouts that we're trying to disguise with, as sort of a, a column that's holding, um, holding this um, uh, other vertical element right here. And it looks out onto a green, green belt on the back side, which is that. So there's um, just a lot of ways that residents who live here can really enjoy the, the outside. The other thing that we um, did in this project was we used these rain gardens. And so this is all the, the roof water from the project uh, coming into these rain gardens. And um, they kind of cascade from one rain garden to the next. So it's a, it's a way of treating the water on site and also uh, by planting plants that um, flower at different seasons. Uh, it's a way that the, the rain gardens can have a, a benefit for the users. Um, so I'd like to speak about sustainability with the Foundation Communities Projects, and they're some of the most sustainable projects that we do. 
uh, these owner they will own this project in perpetuity and so that they also pay all of the uh, electric bills and water bills for the residents who live there so there's a built-in incentive to keep your energy costs as low as possible and so in our market rate projects um, if it's an apartment building it's probably sold in the first five years and so there's very little incentive for the developer to invest in those long-term life cycle costs that will save money over time but if you're selling the project it's hard to convince them that it's um, to their benefit to provide uh, more efficient um, more efficiency in the project so um, it's a really great thing with foundation communities is that we get to really uh, research and um, really I think uh, press the um, press the issue as much as we can and then we also like to say that the knowledge that we gain through doing these uh, projects with them allows us to go to the next market rate project and maybe try to move the needle a little bit further with a, with a developer who might not be as um, open to some of the sustainable ideas. So the sustainable ideas in the project, um, they go through a lot of things. I mean, you can, you know, there's the, the LED light fixtures, it's a, the simple things like that, but one of the most important things is uh, getting the mechanical system to a point where it's a very efficiently operating system. And so with the mechanical system, we're looking at um, ways that uh, benefit the comfort level, the thermal comfort of the folks who live there, but also give them um, a place that operates very efficiently. And um, so when, we, when we're talking about sustainability, we're not just talking about um, recycled materials or LED lighting, it goes very deep. And um, it's, a, it's a great challenge to work with foundation communities and, and really take a deep dive on, on those things. And so um, I don't have a final front picture yet, <laughs> but this is a rendering of it. Um, and it actually turned out uh, much like this. So the, um, the, we have uh, some stucco with these uh, yellow kind of stripes inserted in there, hardy siding, uh, some blue stucco. And then um, this is a tile from uh, Aaron Adams. Um, Aaron Adams is a local tile uh, maker. and. Uh, she supplied us with a, a really beautiful tile to put right by the front door, and um, you know. So I like to say that it's a it's a big long building with a, a three story facade that m might be mistaken for a single family house. It's a it's a very sort of understated facade, um, Planet K store, and uh, this is a, a half acre site, and the half acre site came with two beautiful live oaks. So both of these, it's a 31 and a 33 inch live oak. And um, such a beautiful tree, we um, wanted to incorporate it into the design as well as we had to incorporate it into the design. So um, if you know the Austin uh, tree standards. So what we, um, our solution for this was to use the two trees to be a connection point through this breezeway for the outside social spaces. And so we have some of the common areas over here. So this is, um, we come into the front door over here and everyone who passes through here has to come in through the front door uh, through a, um, a front desk. So they'd like to control who goes in and out of the building. And then um, we use the mail kiosk as another way to bring, um, encourage um, social interaction of um, residents. A computer lab right here uh, small lounge and then a it's it's labeled a kitchen it's really more of a um, a place where you could uh, host potluck dinners and so it's a uh, this is directly adjacent to outdoor space and then the larger outdoor spaces these are provider offices over here so these are offices for uh, social workers who do a variety of things uh, for the residents and then on this uh, side of the uh, breezeway is a, a game room, fitness area, TV room, meeting room, and then this um, maker space. And then uh, outside the building, we have a, a small dog run over there. And then this is a, um, uh, a space for socializing outside. And, um, and then the residents, residential uh, rooms are, um, um, try to describe that you'd come uh, circulate through this building over here and outdoor circulation again and so you really want to we really wanted to make it feel like you're in the treehouse when you're circulating through these spaces 
And this is uh, 110 units, again, for single adults. So now I'm gonna play a movie for you, okay? And um, the movie is a, a fly through through the building. And, um, and you can, uh, once you, now you see it, hopefully you'll drive down South Lamar and you can see the, um, the podium coming up out of the ground. Coming soon. Be, should be open um, next uh, by the end of next year. Okay, so wanting to be affordable. Um, 
and this is uh, our work in modular construction. So I call it wanting to be affordable um, because I want it to be affordable. <laughs> um, uh, our first foray into modular uh, housing was for affordable housing. Um, and there's a, a variety of systems out there for modular construction. And um, the reason I'm calling it wanting to be affordable is that it still has some ways to go before I think that we can uh, confidently use it for affordable housing projects where every material decision and every cost decision has to count. And so um, I'll show you some projects where uh, we were lucky enough to use the, pro the, the system, um, and but I can't necessarily stand here and say that it would have made the price cut for affordable housing. This project I'm going to show you is uh, student housing, and it's in San Marcos. And so the project is arranged around a central stair, and so students come up the central stair. Um, campus is to the left, and so we position these uh, central areas around the stair. And then um, we made a, a grand stair that you can uh, take right here to get upstairs. And then we said, well, let's put the elevators across the courtyard over here so students actually have to walk or make a decision to, uh, to take the stair or take the elevator. Um, and there's a, an, a cheater elevator over here. But you know, the, the idea of, of this was that students are very social as well. And so we thought, you know, let's bring the students through the courtyard. And the courtyard has nice little areas to sit and um, study and um, use the students as a way to, to activate the building. So this is uh, one of our renderings where we showed um, the modules flying in from outer space. And of course, that's uh, the big Lebowski there on the screen. Um, we have a big video screen there. I'll show you in a second. But really, the, the idea was to make this really nice social corner where students come, come and go inside the, to the building. And so this is uh, what it looks like. So this is a terracotta um, a rain screen system. So um, you know, rain screen system is one of those systems where the exterior product is separated from the stud wall so that we get good ventilation and draining of the uh, exterior wall. And so these, uh, this terracotta system is a, is a really nice system. Uh, San Marcos had a requirement for masonry on the building. So I had to stand up in, in front of city council and convince them that this was, in fact, uh, a masonry product. Um, not unlike uh, the Hannes block, which is made in the backyard of, Sa of, um, of San Marcos. Um, so again, the uh, main feature stair is over here. And then um, we did this kind of two stories uh, space to really make a, a nice kind of social space. but. Um, all of these um, ma, uh, um, units were all made in a factory, and I'll show you in a, a second the photos of those, but um, essentially they're made in a factory, um, shipped to the site, and then the um, residential units are um, stacked up on site. Here's a, another view of the um, other side of the building. We have a, a commercial uh, spaces at the at the uh, street level, as well as um, two stories of underground parking. So here's the module inside the factory. So this is made by a company called Z Modular, and these uh, modules are made out of tube steel. And um, Z Modular is owned by Zeckelman Industries, who's also the largest tube steel manufacturer in the country. So they have a reason to make them uh, using tube steel. But you can see um, this is uh, the mock-up in the factory, and you know, working out, the reason we do a mock-up in the factory is to work out some of the kinks um, before they make all 300 some modules. And um, here's one of the modules on site, arrived on site. You can see it's, it's fully furnished. Um, kitchens are installed. Um, everything is painted. Uh, they come wrapped like this. And then when they get to the site, they take their wrapping off and then, uh, then this crane hoists it into place. And then when they're hoisted into place, then there's um, some connector pieces that they uh, screw together to connect them. And then they um, still have to connect the air and weather barriers of the exterior. Um, but uh, the module, when it arrives to the site, theoretically, um, there should be no need to go inside that module. 
And um, so you can just imagine the, there's probably, this is one module, a second module, a third, and a fourth, I think. So just to kind of illustrate how the modules are tucked in there. Uh-oh. What did you, Dante? <laughs> there we go. And again, this is a, a inside the courtyard where we have these uh, benches and um, and as much greenery as we can. And again, here's the uh, the stair that we want you to take. Um, and then um, behind us would be the elevator. So students walk through this uh, courtyard to access the elevator. And then um, let me try to make these big, kind of over oversized stairs for uh, students to to sit on. And they probably all. Um, beat it to hell by now, but <laughs> hopefully we made it uh, bulletproof. So there's the, uh, the screen where the Big Lebowski was showing. And just uh, one quick movie to understand how it all lays out. And um, Patrick Wong, um, our uh, esteemed photographer here, um, I think you did this movie as well as the uh, photographs for the, for the project. So um, we use the same Z modular system then for two uh, offices for uh, steel companies. And so this is a front office for a steel company in San Antonio called Reliance Metal Center. And these uh, right here are the modules. Um, and this is a, a company that Z modular um, does business with. And so they're building it with their system for a client of theirs. And so this is the, uh, the final product. Um, we use these clear story modules to stack on top of um, uh, the other modules. One thing with, that with uh, shipping modules is that you have to get it down the highway. And so your um, constraints of your module dimensions are what a truck can uh, transport. And so they're kind of height challenged, but with these clear story modules, uh, we wanted to get some additional height and get some um, light in there so you can see this uh, clear story back there to get some additional light into the project and again it's a steel company so we have lots of steel and here's one of the modules in the factory and there are factories in Killeen, Texas And here you can see the, the extra height that we got um, with the, with, by stacking an uh, extra half module on top. So then um, we did this almost the same thing in Riverside, California. Um, another uh, related steel company called Crest Steel. Um, this is a, this building's so huge that a train drives through this building over here. Um, and this is a um, front office and so I um, actually got licensed in California for this project, and um, I didn't quite know what I was getting into when I said, yeah, I'll just get licensed in California. And boy, that test in California is a doozy. <laughs> Every other state, you just pay some money and wait, wait three months for your license. But man, uh, this test uh, uh, had, me, had me scared. <laughs> um, so again, um, we're doing some things that we might not otherwise do on projects, um, knowing that we're working with a steel company and we have access to all this steel. Um, so we made these screen panels and then um, had this bright idea to um, laser cut the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the tube steel um, to get these sort of geometric or wavy kind of shapes um, across the front of the building. Um, this is a, a zinc panel And um, this is uh, Riverside, California, so it um, starts getting into the desert uh, climate there. Um, I thought it was incredibly hot and dry there. So that the screen panels are um, intended to screen the glass of the office. And these are the modules in the factory. So, um, you know, you can see the module demarcations here. Um, 
you will have columns inside of a, a space like this. Offices, you know, typically don't have intermediate columns, but uh, because of the modules, we, you know, we knew that we're going to have columns in there, and um, just have to accept some things about modular construction that um, will be somewhat different than site built. And then um, here you can see a detail of, of how we laser cut these um, tube steel to make the make the wavies. Okay, I say this I say it somewhat tongue, tongue in cheek. Um, they're completely unaffordable, but um, again, I'd like to you know position it in that um, we're doing affordable housing work. You might think that that's cheap, inexpensive um, uh, housing type, but it's really not. It's better built, as I said, than. Um, most market rate projects. Um, we love uh, doing um, uh, custom homes, and so it's a different dynamic. Um, affordable housing, we're designing for someone who's not sitting at the design table with us, so we're trying to think what it might be to be in a situation coming from homelessness or coming from trauma in your life. When we come to uh, designing a custom home, we're, dealing, we're working with a client, obviously. And so they're there at the, the table, design table with us, and they are really guiding us through the project. And so it's, um, it's always a collaboration uh, with an owner to uh, design their, their dream, dream home. And so in this case, this is a, a house uh, for a couple with um, two daughters who are about to start college um, out on um, Hamilton Pool Road. So uh, in this case, it's a, it's a five acre site. And they have a you know, pretty wide range of views out of the house. Um, but, um, you know, in this case, it ended up being a, somewhat of a, a farmhouse style. They they came to us with a much more traditional um, kind of set of design characteristics. And through the process, they had so much fun doing it that they really ended up um, pushing the, they came to us midway through the process and said, you know, we want to go a little bit more uh, contemporary with this, and so it was uh, a chance to um, take it to a, a slightly different direction. So you can see it's a you know, large site with a, uh, an equestrian uh, barn to the to the side, and so the materials on this are uh, hardy siding and also um, stone, and then um, a siding color that's just uh, painted uh, dark. And um, inside the house, they you know, had to have the, the big uh, sliding doors that we're finally getting to that weather in uh, October when you can finally open those doors. And um, I always say that those doors are open on two times a year at the, uh, a night like this and at the AIA home store. <laughs> um, just another view of the, the courtyard. We, um, you know, in, in Texas, we tend to always put the, the pool right at the edge of the uh, patio. And, um, and these owners grew up in the Northeast, and they said, no, we want, we want grass between the patio and the pool. And it's something that we, you know, we do see when we look at um, architecture from uh, Northeast. And I grew up in the Northeast, and um, that was always the way it was. It was you know, the pool was separated from the house. But um, so many of our projects, we end up with the pool um, being situated right next to the courtyard. And there's a, a view of the bedroom. And they've got this um, backlit uh, stone. I think it might be onyx. Um, not quite sure. So um, this is a project. Um, Trey Farmer in my office and um, Adrian. There's Adrian. Um, did for themselves. And so this is in Clarksville. And so this is a... Um, a bungalow that they uh, renovated down to the stud, and um, and so this is a, a really special house in that uh, one. It's uh, it's beautiful, but it's also a, a certified passive house, and so um, part of our um, sustainability drive is to to be a leader in the passive house um, movement. And some of the things that Trey did here was that um, I know that he was. Um, um, or let me back up. As part of uh, building in this climate zone, we tried to seal out all the air from the outside. You know that the outside air has lots of humidity in it, plus heat, and so if we can keep that air out, our air conditioning system can function more efficiently. And so um, 
Uh, Trey was con convinced that he could keep the air out just by sealing really well all around the house. And, um, and Adrian, as you know, he you spent three weeks chasing leaks around in the house. Um, and uh, he came to the conclusion that um, the best way to do it was with a, a product called Aero Barrier. And so Aero Barrier is a, a product that is um, aerosolized. It's, it's kind of like a reverse blower door test where you actually um, negatively pressurize the house, send this um, aerosol into the house, and it finds all of the um, nooks and crannies of leaks in the house that are flying outside to the outside air. And so it um, actually seals those leaks. And so in a matter of, I think, three hours, um, he got down to a, a really low level of um, um, air leakage. And so it's um, that's part of the, one of the things that we do for a passive house project is um, it's air sealing, it's window selection, uh, mechanical selection, and those are some of the key things uh, for that. And then just a lot of um, effort spent with the contractor to um, really um, construct it in a way to keep that air out. And um, again, this is in uh, Clarksville. And um, Adrian is um, the interior designer, uh, studio firm, and um, did a, just a wonderful job with, with their house. And this is my house. Um, so um, I like to say that, you know, working on your own house, um, it's like a laboratory. Um, my wife loves that it's a laboratory. She doesn't really, but um, uh, for, me, for me it was because I did learn a lot. Um, and um, I did this house in uh, 2013. Uh, Matt Reisinger uh, built it. And um, if you ever want to know anything about construction or building science, you probably Googled a Matt Reisinger video and he showed you how to do something. Um, and so um, while this isn't a, a passive house certified project, um, we did a, a number of the same things that um, Trey and Adrian did in their house. Um, but the, I think the, one of the substantial things to point out is that in 2013, we didn't have access to uh, the aero, aero barrier product. And so air sealing um, was still a very cumbersome um, kind of thing to do. And so um, we built it not with a, as tight as Trey's house, but with a lot of the same mechanical system selections um, that we're doing on a, a high, highly efficient homes. And so uh, my house is in, in Cornavaca. Um, which, if you know Cornavaca, it's a kind of a um, eclectic um, community. Uh, we eclectic in a good way. It's kind of like uh, the South Austin of uh, Westlake, I like to say. And um, so the uh, I'm using uh, Ethos on the uh, siding. Uh, again, Ethos is an insulated stucco product. Um, and then uh, the wood siding has uh, insulation uh, behind it as well. So cavity insulation and exterior insulation. Uh, you can see the mechanical system is the, the VRF um, type, which is a variable refrigerant flow, which is uh, very efficient. In my little, little, little living room. And uh, the booth that my wife insisted on that had to um, be like a what year Thunderbird, like a 19, I think a 64 Thunderbird, and it had to be, it had to be a uh, blue glitter vinyl. Um, and then this is, um, uh, I'm going to close with this house. This one is in design right now, and this is a site in uh, the trails of Lake LBJ. So this is um, Horseshoe Bay area, and this is um, a really beautiful site that um, overlooks uh, Lake LBJ. And so in this case, um, and Josh, who's here as well, is our lead um, on this project. And um, this is for a commercial contractor uh, from Houston, and um, he'll be building it himself as well. And so this, uh, this site has such wonderful views, and it has these um, big rock outcroppings in it. And so what we really want to do is um, make it feel like, one, the house is coming out of the ground. Um, this rock is that... Um, beautiful uh, brown sandstone with green lichens on it um, and so the uh, the site is so beautiful and we want just want you know this stone selection to feel like it's um, 
coming up out of the ground. And then uh, we're also using um, CLT on the roof, so that's a cross-laminated timber. So if you know anything about uh, cross-laminated timber is that it can uh, cantilever in two directions. So we get this beautiful cantilever out here uh, without having to do um, a lot of uh, beams and uh, columns to support that. And a view from the living room. And again, this um, uh, massive cantilever out here that we've got one column supporting. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, they tell me it'll work, but it's, uh, it's, a, it, it's just such a, a beautiful product to be able to, to cantilever like that. Thank you. That is it for tonight. I'd be happy to take any questions uh, anyone has. Yes. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say I'm a big fan of you guys. I've been following your oh, affordable you. housing for a, a while. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, you're an inspiration. And uh, I want to know how you got into affordable housing. Yeah, good, good question. Um, so, um, um, what year was that? I think 2011, Foundation Communities put out an RFQ um, and sent it to Dick Clark Architecture. And so when I saw the RFQ, um, I didn't know Foundation Communities at that time. Um, but once I found out, um, I found out that it was something I really wanted to do. And working with a nonprofit was uh, also something that I really wanted to do. I've done a lot of custom homes, or, you know, really you know, fancy homes, and that's and that's fun. I love I love doing that. Um, but the opportunity then to work with someone like Foundation Communities um, was a, was a great challenge. Um, I grew up, my dad working in nonprofit um, retirement communities, and so kind of understood the um, kind of the service um, that's involved with uh, uh, being involved with nonprofits. And so I saw it as a, a great opportunity, and uh, I just really went for it. <laughs> and so um, Capital Studios was definitely a, a learning experience. Um, um, it was a really hard site to do for a number of reasons. Um, but, you know, kept at it. Uh, I was fortunate enough that they asked me to do the, the next one, uh, which was Blue Bonnet Studios. Um, and I think that we, I think our office, for our office, these are really special projects. Um, every time I work with foundation communities, it's a it's a chance to improve on the last one, take it to the next one, understand some new things. Uh, we're designing another one with them right now uh, on Parker Lane called Parker Apartments, uh, and that's a family property. And so we're uh, researching what trauma-informed design means. And so trauma-informed design means um, you name it, and coming from a, a, a wide variation of your backgrounds, uh, in some cases from people experiencing homelessness or trauma in their life. And then what does that mean for design? And how can, um, how can anything from locating a, a mailbox kiosk help inform um, trauma-informed design and then make a, make a circumstance easier for a resident? And um, so um, as we've, done more projects with foundation and communities. We've done others now. Um, we have one, I uh, just started construction in Houston, and that's with a, a group called Temenos, and they're providing housing for some of the um, hardest uh, individuals to, to house, as well as uh, providing 15 units for uh, first responders to take um, inebriated uh, homeless people to, and um, they're allowed to live there, um, and um, they're called wet units. Um, they're allowed to um, be there and not sober, and so it's um, you know we're we're realizing there's a pretty wide range of circumstances that people come to uh, in some of these uh, projects. And like I said, it could be your friends, family, neighbors, or in the case of Temenos, some very sort of um, folks who've had a, quite a hard run at it in life. Um, I would say the the 